Good morning, my name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at BCEC. I just wanna welcome you to New Community Worship, especially if this is your first time with us. Uh, we'd love to learn of your visit, and so uh, below there is a guest book, and so if you would fill it out, we'd love to connect with you. Right after the service, we have a time of, of just uh, fellowship where we just meet and greet one another as well as update and pray for one another. So we would encourage you to stick around for that. Uh, again, the information is uh, below. We hope that uh, we have an opportunity to meet you. And so uh, just a few uh, updates, for, uh, community life updates. We mentioned a few last week uh, concerning uh, Pastor Daniel and uh, just the announcement that he has been selected as the next senior pastor through our boards, the BOD, the BOE. And so the final step is the uh, special congregational meeting. And so uh, you, if you're a member, you probably should have gotten a, a mailing uh, and concerning proxy voting because we're allowing proxy voting uh, this time around since it's going to be a virtual um, congregational meeting. And so if you've not received that, I would encourage you to uh, go to the newsletter where you'll find an email for you to request a a paper copy of the proxy vote if you want to do that. There is a way to vote online the day of, and so there'll be more instructions on that. And so that special congregational meeting is on September 13th. We will also have a meet and greet with Pastor Daniel next week, August 23rd at 2.30. And so that's an opportunity for us to get to know Pastor Daniel and so, again, in the newsletter, you'll find a link to any questions that you might want to ask Pastor Daniel. And so uh, you'll have an opportunity to do that as well. In addition, we have a, a baptism coming up. And so that is on uh, September. Let me check, double check the date here. Uh, September 20th. And so if you are interested in... Um, publicly professing your faith in Jesus Christ and uh, you and want to get baptized, come and see me. Uh, there's a process where you would meet with me and I would do uh, just kind of a, a brief uh, kind of interview and, and, and just kind of run through what baptism is. And, and so uh, on September 20th, we're going to be at 249. It's going to be an outdoor uh, baptism. And so uh, we just encourage you. We, we've, I think we've had to cancel our last two uh, because of the pandemic. And so uh, we, are, we have a wonderful plan, a socially distanced, safe plan for, for us to gather and to continue in our mission to uh, make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of Jesus. And so, uh, so if you're interested, come and speak to me. And so as we uh, continue in our worship service, we just encourage you to, uh, at this moment, to fix your eyes on, on our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let us um, just come before Him, uh, just desiring to encounter uh, Christ and, and His Word. And so would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to come together as, as a community. And we just want to praise you and thank you for your goodness and grace each and every day, for your faithfulness, for being present with us, Lord, even uh, through uh, these challenging and difficult times in our lives. We confess to you our need for you. We confess the, uh, just the reality that, that without you, uh, we are helpless and hopeless. But with you, Lord, there is uh, help from the Holy Spirit and a, a hope of of uh, a life with you uh, now and forever. And so we thank you that we are not uh, left here alone uh, to fend for ourselves, but because of your Son, because of your Spirit, uh, you are indwelling in each of us. And Lord, that you uh, strengthen us and encourage us uh, in these moments uh, to live for you and to live uh, for your glory. And so, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful and precious truth. Lord, as we continue through this worship, we pray that you would draw us to closer to you, that um, wherever we are uh, in our journey, that you would meet us, God, and that you would transform us, Lord, through your word, that we would become more and more like you as we spend time with you, as we spend time in your word, as we spend time with each other, although in a socially distanced way. 
Lord, we pray for our world. We uh, continue to see all its, its uh, brokenness, all the cracks, all the uh, fractures in our society uh, because of COVID-19. And we just pray, Father, for just especially the many regions where um, uh, the COVID cases are, are surging. And we just pray, Father, for your mercy and your grace, uh, for the health of, of every person, for those who are on the front lines, for uh, the overburdened um, uh, medical facilities and the hospitals, for the overburdened doctors and nurses and those who um, are just working on uh, just over time, just meeting the needs of, of, of people. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would just sustain them and strengthen them and encourage them. We pray as the fall nears, and we know there's a lot of fear and anxiety and tension concerning schooling. And so I know many of us are, are affected in some way, whether as teachers, uh, as, as professors, or um, as administrators, uh, trying to find the best way to care for students, but also as parents and just the challenging decisions that are be before uh, before them and, and just all the, the ways in which um, uh, there's just so much confusion and heartache. And so we pray for wisdom, for peace, for your presence to be with us as, as many people have to navigate through uh, what seems like no-win situations. But Lord, I pray uh, that you would just be sovereign and that you would remind us uh, that you indeed are in control. Lord, we uh, pray for our world and we continue to pray for healing and for your presence to be with the people of Beirut and for the aftermath of the explosion and the many attentions that exist there. We pray, uh, Lord, for your peace, for your presence, for your comfort to continue to be with uh, them in, the, in this region. Lord, we pray for our church and we thank you for uh, just uh, this good news that Pastor Daniel has is, is, uh, been elected to be our, uh, chosen to be our, our next senior pastor. And, and we just thank you, Father, for your calling upon his life and for your leading upon him. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, as he uh, prepares for this role and as our congregations come together to a vote, we just pray for uh, you to be glorified, for your will to be done, for the process to uh, be smooth as we are venturing into new territory in terms of a virtual uh, special congregational meeting with pro proxy voting, online voting. And so we pray and give all these things into your hands, Lord, the technology of it and all the deacons who are behind the scenes, uh, making sure uh, that uh, this process will run smoothly. And so we uh, pray for their work. We pray for our um, kind of participation in this process. We thank you that we have uh, as a congregation the the, the ability and the privilege as members to, to play a part in this process. And so, Lord, may we uh, just do our part as members to uh, affirm uh, what uh, you are doing in our midst. And so we pray for Pastor Daniel as he prepares for this, this critical role during this critical time. And we just pray that you would give him uh, just affirmation and, and peace, Lord. And as, as, he, um, as he contemplates what you have in store for us, uh, in the future. And so, Lord, would you be with him and Bethar and his family, and that you would uh, just strengthen him and prepare him for this important work. Uh, we just continue to lift this service to your hands and pray, Lord, that all that we do and all that we say, um, all our thoughts, how we feel, would all uh, just be offered to you, God, so that you may have your way with us, Lord. And so we uh, just give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Saul is going to lead us in this next song, and so let us uh, give our hearts uh, to the Lord. You came to the world you created, training your crown for a cross, willingly die. In life with the call Counting your status as nothing King of all kings came to serve Washing my feet Covering me with your love 
If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure. One that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Oh Lord, change me like a Since we have Christ who has brought us reconciliation and peace through his death on the cross, now we have the ability to pass the peace to one another. So everyone, please stand and greet your brothers and sisters all around you. And if you don't have anybody around you, grab that phone, make that call to pass the peace of Christ to one another by saying, may the peace of Christ be with you. And let the response be, and also with you. So let us rise and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Today's scripture reading is from Proverbs. Please let us read together. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in your eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2. Every way a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. One pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 2. Let another praise you, and not your own mouth a stranger and not your own lips. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Hello once again. Uh, so glad that you've again joined us for, for worship. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we uh, spend time in God's Word? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we come before you uh, just desiring uh, to hear from you, God, uh, to hear from your Word, to be convicted by your Spirit, to be encouraged by what you would have to say, but also to be challenged uh, to live our lives uh, that would bring honor and glory to you. And so, Lord, be present with us now and help us to be present as well uh, to the preaching of your word. And so, Lord, we give this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever uh, encountered somebody who lacked self-awareness or somebody who just seemed really clueless about how they were coming across? Uh, perhaps one example that best illustrates this is several years ago, there was a really popular uh, reality TV show called American Idol, which was kind of the, really the big thing. Um, everybody seemed to have watched it. And partly uh, we were just drawn in to the amazing skills of, of certain musicians. Uh, but I think there's the other side of it. In the earlier rounds, uh, what we oftentimes were drawn into wasn't so much the talent of people, they, these hidden talents, but it's people who lack talent or those who lack skill. Even more so, it was the lack of self-awareness that oftentimes was entertaining to most people because here are people who came on the scene, wanted to audition, thought they were amazing, but in reality, they were pretty bad and the judges were pretty harsh. And so there was a certain delight that uh, one derived from seeing somebody completely self-aware and getting flame for it. And so uh, there's something about that that kind of causes us to laugh, but if we really think about it, if we're really honest with ourselves, a self-awareness is not something that comes easily, right? Self-awareness is not just this innate thing that one has. It's, it's something that needs to be cultivated. And oftentimes, especially these days, self-awareness is in short supply. Oftentimes there are certain things that are going on within us that we don't even realize. Uh, Brene Brown, a social scientist, uh, once made this fairly bold comment that the reason why there's so much hatred and unhappiness in this world is as a result of people's lack of self-awareness. Now, as I think about that, again, that, that's a very bold statement to make, and, and it's something that seems, uh, something as simple as self-awareness, it's hard to believe that that has so many repercussions, uh, but the more I think about it, the more I'm inclined to believe in it. I mean, you think about just as we go about day, our day-to-day -day lives, um, sometimes we're just not aware of just the things that are going on within us. And oftentimes, um, certain conditions, certain situations kind of bring out this ugly side out of us, right? And it causes damage to our relationships. So there are outbursts that we don't expect out of us. There, there are things that come out of our mouth that, that we normally wouldn't say, but for whatever reason, we said it at that very moment. And that's when we begin to realize how much we lack self-awareness. We lack understanding about what is going on underneath the surface. As my good friend would often say, there were oftentimes like overstuffed Twinkies. I don't know if you ever had one of those, these, these kind of these pastries from Hostess, these ye yellow on the outside and there's cream on the inside. 
And, and my friend would often say that we're like overstuffed Twinkies. All it takes is a little pressure for all of our guts to ooze out. And oftentimes that's all it takes. It's just a little pressure, pressure of life, circumstances being a little crazy for just all this mess to kind of emerge out of our lives. And we don't plan for it. We don't expect it. It just happens. Why? Because we lack self-awareness concerning the things that are going on in our own hearts. And so the question I want us to ask is, how can you and I grow in greater self-awareness? We're looking through the book of Proverbs through the summer just to explore different themes. And so one of the themes that we're going to be looking at today is how we need to cultivate humility. Self-awareness and humility are, are closely connected. And so we're, if, if self-awareness seems to... I don't know, psychobabble to you and, and you prefer the word humility, okay, how can we grow in greater humility? How can we grow in, in a greater self-awareness of ourselves and the world around us? And so there's three things that, that we want to take a look at today. Number one, uh, where does self-awareness truly come from? Where does it come from? Where's the source of self-awareness? If, if self-awareness is short in supply, so where, where do we find it? Where, what's the source? the first question or point. The second point is, well, what gets in the way of self-awareness? What gets in the way? What are things that that sabotage, that that are barriers toward self-awareness? And lastly, what are are things that we need to cultivate in order to grow in self-awareness? Okay, so number one, what's the source of our self-awareness? Number two, what are the barriers or what gets in the way of self-awareness? Number three, what are things that we need to cultivate in order to grow in greater self-awareness. Okay, so we're going to uh, jump around in the book of Proverbs. And so if you would turn in, in your Bibles uh, to uh, first chapter 3, verse 7, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, chapter 20, verse 9, chapter 21, verse 2. And I'm going to read it for us uh, again and just to kind of jog our memories. Um, first point being, where does this, our source of self-awareness come from? Uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Do not, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Chapter 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart pure. I am clean from sin. And chapter 21, verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. There it is again. But the Lord weighs the heart. Let me just pause there and just consider, as we think about self-awareness, one th- uh, we can look at it in, t- in two ways, two subpoints. Uh, where does self-awareness not come from and where does self-awareness truly come from? So where does it not come from? Um, I think it's, it's fair to say um, that, that it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from just ourselves. That our, self, our own self-assessments are, are not enough. It's... it's, it's it's actually oftentimes distorted. We, we don't really see ourselves accurately. We do not see ourselves objectively. We need something outside of ourselves to do that. In fact, um, the Proverbs also warns against that. So be not wise in your own eyes. In other words, don't trust in your own self-assessment to understand what's truly right and wrong, what is good and evil, what is beautiful and what is not. Uh, we don't have an objective standard by which that only comes from within that we can judge our lives in an adequate and, and, and um, uh, factual and accurate way. Uh, later in chapter 21, uh, verse 2, every, man, uh, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, meaning we all have different ways of looking at things and we lower the standards when we want to lower standards, we want to higher standards when we want higher standards. And so all this to say is that we are not objective within ourselves, that we are not accurate judges of ourselves. Either we think too highly of ourselves, we think too low of ourselves, somewhere in between, uh, or we kind of pendulum back and forth, going back and forth. And so we're just these complicated beings that really have, oftentimes are, are in, really don't have an accurate gauge of, of how we should see ourselves. Um, in Chapter 20, verse 9, is, he says, Who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from my sin? Uh, again, it's, it's pointing to the fact that who, who among us can, if we're just 
in a vacuum on our own are able to kind of with any integrity say that that what um, that I have made my heart pure that I'm without sin and the moment that you say that or claim that again um, we're right from the get-go uh, the moment we say that we're self-deceived all you have to do is ask somebody around you you ask your family member and they'll just laugh at you the notion that you're without sin, the, the notion that we've made our own hearts pure, they can see. They know when you lash out at them. They know when you're selfish. They know. Uh, and so f the, 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 for us to think that we're above all that is laughable to the people who are closest to us. So again, where does, where, where's the source of self-awareness? It, it can't come from just ourselves alone. Uh, it, it can't just be ourselves because the way that we see ourselves, we have, we have a distorted lens and, and we don't see everything. And we only want to see what we want to see and the things that we don't want to see, we don't want to see. So where does our source of self-awareness come from? It has to come from somebody outside of ourselves. It has to come from somebody who's objective. And I would argue, especially if you're a Christian today, that that our objectivity, our source, again, cannot come from ourselves. I wouldn't even say it should come from other people, but it comes from God. So let's take a look at that again. Uh, Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Okay? Later, chapter 21, verse 2 again, every way of a man is right, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. So what that is saying here is, is that we need God to give us understanding of ourselves. Uh, we need to put God in its, His rightful and central place in our lives. That it, it speaks of fearing the Lord as the beginning of all wisdom, as He repeats over and over again throughout Proverbs. But what that is telling us is that if we really want to be wise, if we really want to have actual, clear understanding of who we are, to have an accurate assessment of who we are, we need to look to God, that we need to fear God, that we need to put God in His proper place in our own lives. That, that it's not, fear is not terror. Fear is just simply uh, understanding the gravity of who God is and, and appropriately responding to Him with reverence and with respect. We acknowledge that God is God and we are not, that we are acknowledging that God is above us and the one who created us. And the, the faster that we come to the realization or understanding that, that God is God and we are not, it actually helps quite a, quite a bit in terms of how we should see ourselves. That if we understand that there is a distinction between God, the Creator, and us humans as creation, the more we acknowledge that and, and, and abide by that truth, the more we'll understand ourselves better. John Calvin, um, the, the reformer, would, would often say at the beginning of his uh, Institutes of Christian Religion, he would say that the knowledge of, of man, the knowledge of ourselves, the knowledge of God, they, they go hand in hand, uh, that they're inseparable, um, that, 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 as one person puts it, that, that we lose out on one or the other. Um, we lose out on one aspect of it if in exclusion of the other, meaning if we truly cannot know ourselves without knowing God, and we truly can't uh, know God without knowing ourselves. And so uh, it's an important kind of concept to think about. And the way I would like to frame it is, what better way to know ourselves than to know the God who created us? You know, I say this many times, but, but God knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Not only is He the one who created us, that in the Bible it talks about that He had us in mind before the foundations of the world, that we were knitted in His mother's room, that He has full knowledge. We're, we are fully known from the very beginning up until now and into the future. And so that in itself uh, should be either maybe terrifying to you because, gosh, if God knows everything, meaning not only, know, not only does He know 
just the ins and outs of my life. He knows my motives. He knows my fears. He knows my, my anxieties. He knows the jealousy within me. He knows the envy. He knows the covetousness. He knows all these things. He knows what drives us. He knows what makes us sick. He knows um, the, the secrets in my own hearts, the, the things that we, 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 we try to hide from other people. God knows all of that. So part of us is, is very threatened by that idea that God knows us better than we know ourselves. So there's something very unsettling about that reality, if it is indeed true. But here's the other side of it, that God, the reason why God knows, not because he's just this creeper and that he's, he's just you know, a voyeur and he just wants, he wants to get in our business, but that's just who God is, and, and God knows us to such a degree um, because he loves us, he created us. He, he, he wants us to, he wants to know us, and he wants us to know him. And so it's actually a freeing thing to know that, you know, before God, there's no secrets. He already knows you, everything about you. And, and I think there's actually something incredibly freeing about that. That the very things that cause us consternation or shame or, or guilt where we just want to hide from God, God's like, you know what, I already know all those things. Like, why, what's the problem? What's the problem? Why, why are you fearing coming near me? Because I already know all these things. And yes, I know all these things in many ways hurt you and bring shame and all these things, but the fact that God knows us so intimately and deeply should cause us to perhaps consider that the way one is to know oneself is to also understand a God who knows us. That if God knows everything about us, then perhaps what God is trying to do is, why don't you not only get to know me, but in the course of getting to know me, you're getting to know yourself in the process too. Now, again, this is something that perhaps is unnerving to you because it seems like, well, is that the kind of God that we have, that God wants to have that kind of depth in our relationship that is not just about superficial outward actions, um, but it's actually so much deeper? Yes, and yes, this is the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with Him and to ourselves. That God doesn't want us to continue to live in this, this bubble or this, this alternate reality where we just want to believe what we want to believe about ourselves, inclusion of everything else. But the fact that God knows all of us and knows everything about us and yet does not reject us, but in Christ, that He still accepts us, uh, that in itself is powerful. That in itself is the key to life, is to recognize this is who God is. So again, first question, <laughs> where does the source of self-awareness come from? It, it comes not from ourselves. It doesn't even come from other people. It comes from God. The God who knows us, the God who, who, who uh, receives us as we are. Now, begs the question, well, what, you know, what gets in the way of, of us, you know, becoming self-aware? And, and we see pretty clearly, uh, we see this theme throughout uh, Proverbs. Uh, we see this in, in chapter um, 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Chapter 29, verse 23. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Now, I think it's pretty clear here, pretty ob fairly obvious, the obstacle or what gets in the way of us becoming self-aware is pride. Beneath every kind of action, sinful action, I believe is oftentimes pride. Think about all the conflicts and the issues that come up in your life. So much of it is what? It's as a result of pride. The part of us that wants to protect whatever image that we're trying to project to, to other people, that whatever defensiveness that, that exists within us, that, that, uh, that in many ways, like, uh, we're trying to like, deflect and defend. And, and, and again, we're just trying to protect something. Uh, we're trying to protect our honor. We're trying to protect our reputation. And any 
criticism that comes our way or anything that would tarnish that image, we're, we're just fierce to protect it and we're fierce to push back. We're fierce to, to try to uh, kind of do some damage control or image you know, or some kind of um, um, image management, if you will. And so oftentimes, pride, this, this, this pride is what gets in the way of us from really understanding self because we have this overinflated view of, of ourselves. And, and again, we want to see what we want to see. We want to, we want to believe what we want to believe about ourselves. We want to make sure that everybody else around you is, is on point and, and believing what you believe about yourself. And so oftentimes that, that's what drives us in life. Now, a close cousin to, to this pride of, of just having an overinflated sense of ourself is, is also this, this under, uh, this, this, this part of us that, that wants to uh, denigrate ourselves or, or thinks less of themselves and, and, and not in a humility kind of, a, de- a genuine humility kind of way, but in a, in a self, like a despising kind of way. That that itself is a cousin of pride as well. Because in a sense, what we're saying is that we're so like worthless, we're so um, just uh, meaningless that that all our lives are just kind of to be discarded and thrown away. That we're so dispensable. That in itself is also a form of pride. In what way? Meaning that we we think we're so bad that we're so far beyond the reaches of God's grace. And that in itself is basically saying, you know what, God, I know myself better than you, and. Consequently, I am irredeemable, I am not salvageable, I am not redeemable. And so we are fixed in our minds how we think of ourselves. And that, that's also a form of self-protection because we're not, we don't want to let anybody in. We don't want to let other people in on what's actually going on in our lives because we're, we don't want people to see. So again, pride rears its ugly head and prevents us from seeing... Um, what we need to see. And you think about uh, what, I guess, the, the writer of Proverbs said, pride goes before the destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's again reminding us that, that as things snowball, as things uh, kind of take, you know, we could either um, kind of go in that direction where we continue to believe what we want to believe about ourselves, and, um, but in the end, it, it brings destruction. And, and one's pride will bring one low, meaning we're just going to learn the hard way that all the things that you want to believe about yourself, it's all going to get exposed at some point. At some point, whether it be in now or in the near future, all that's going to be seen for what it is. And, you know, the closer people who are to you, they, they already see it, they already smell, they already detect that there's something, there's something off about how you present yourself and who you truly are. And it's only a matter of time when there's a reckoning of sorts where people call you out on whatever stuff that you're trying to kind of pitch. And, and, and the writer of Proverbs is, is trying to warn us from pride, to not let pride get in the way of greater self-awareness or to get in the way of what God wants you to see about yourselves. Because oftentimes, why we're so prideful is that we, we don't want to face the real you, the real me, right? We really don't want to face the ugliness that exists within. We'd rather just camp out on the things that we are proud of about ourselves, or the things that we want to see about ourselves. But, but what God wants us to do is to have a 360-degree view of ourselves, to recognize that, you know what, all the things that we think we are, we're, we're, we're not. We're not. And so, again, these are the things that, that prevent us from, from seeing. It's, it's our pride. It, it's, it's just thinking in such a way that it's such a distortion to who you really are. And so, as you think about your life, think about all the ways in which pride just trips you up. The way pride is like the root of, of just so many just dysfunction in your own life, in your own relationships. Think about all the ways and perhaps you are living in denial and how you constantly you know, shift blame to other people or you make excuses for your lives. All that is a manifestation of pride that exists within you. So 
as we think about again this passage in these passages we're, we're saying okay well, what's the source of self-awareness it's God what gets in the way it's pride so how if, if we kind of come to the place where okay what do we do now if, if this is kind of where we are we're, we're kind of stuck in this cycle of, of just trying to you know be a certain person who are not then then what's the what's what's the next step? So the last point is simply this: Well, how can we cultivate, therefore, a a, a life of greater self awareness, a life of, of where we are facing what's 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 there, what's 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 underneath the surface? So let's take a look at um, a few verses here, uh, chapter twenty seven, uh, verse two, um, and also chapter twenty one, verse twenty one. Um, well, let's, let's back up to 23, 20, 20, 29, 23 as well. One's pride will bring him low, as we talked about before, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Verse 27, verse 2, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. So it's fairly obvious, right, that in order to cultivate, what, what do we need to cultivate in order to live in greater self-awareness? Um, it's, it's humility. It's, it's being able to humble yourself. Rather than get humbled, which is what will result if you continue to live a life of pride, the antidote to that is humility. Instead of learning the hard way and getting humbled, rather we, from the outset, just are cultivating humility. We're, we're, we're trying to cultivate rather a haughty spirit. We're trying to cultivate lowly in spirit. And, and, and that in itself will, will bring honor. Meaning when we uh, take intentional steps to practice and cultivate humility in our lives, um, that is what's going to bring life. We think by pri- being prideful and trying to like seek honor for ourselves and what have you, that that will bring life? But no, in the Proverbs, but all throughout the scripture, it seems to indicate that humility, the self-awareness, is the key to true life. That, that to cultivate humility is what will honestly bring um, a certain degree of wholeness in our lives because we're not trying to um, hide anything, we're not trying to deny reality, but we're trying to actually face what's actually there. We're trying to face uh, what is before us, right? And so um, here, here's a few things to kind of consider as we think about these verses, chapter 29, verse, uh, chapter 27, uh, verse 2, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. This is really interesting because, again, oftentimes at a pride, we, we want to speak well of ourselves and, 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 and we're, we're reliant on other people to approve of us. So, um, but the, the writer of the Proverbs says, let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Basically what he's, what he's trying to say is, well, don't be dependent on what you say about yourselves or what strangers say about you, but let another praise you. What, it, what, what that's saying is that let another person be the one who builds you up. Um, let another person be the one who informs you on uh, what on on who you are, meaning it goes kind of hand in hand. Yes, the source of self awareness is God, this objective standard of who God is. But but as we also mentioned before, that community is also involved in terms of enabling us to be self aware. That God uses His Word, He uses community to humble us. He uses relationships and close friendships to help us grow. And so how do we cultivate self-awareness? We we need God, yes, but we also need other people. And rather than depend upon what you say about yourself, rather depend upon strangers or people who don't know you to inform who you are, we are to trust in what God says about us, we're supposed to trust in what other people Say, have to say about us, that we are relying and trusting in God and other people to tell the full truth of who you are, the simultaneous reality that, yes, you're both a, a sinner, but you're also a saint, 
That, that you can be really sacrificial in one moment, but then you could be really selfish in another moment. You could be really loving and unconditionally loving in one moment, but you could also be lustful in another. You could be anti-racist in one moment, and yes, simultaneously be racist at the same time. That speaks of the complexity of the human experience. It explains the complexity and the paradox of what it means to be human. And yet, the common thread, hopefully, uh, is this, is that God who sees all, who knows all, through Christ, He doesn't reject you, even though you deserve to be rejected, but He receives you. He doesn't, he doesn't put you away. He doesn't, he doesn't um, discard the relationship. Rather, He accepts us and He loves us. And hopefully, a, a community is also doing that as well. It's going to be imperfect, it's going to be messy because we're still sinful, but nonetheless, God's heart is for the community of faith to be, again, a mirror for you, just as God is, God's Word is a mirror to you, so that you can see, have a 360 degree view of yourself, that it's not just all bad, meaning, you know, the truth of, you know, facing the truth of just all your imperfections, although that is a huge part of it, but it's also as a community reminding us of who we are in Christ as well. That, that we're, that's the key to just discipleship really is, is yes, acknowledging our sinfulness, acknowledging and facing and, and owning up to our own brokenness, but at the same time, it's owning up to who we now are as a result of knowing God and knowing Christ. The moment we, the, 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 when we forget that reality, that's, that's when we get lost. But when we truly understand the full extent of His love, the full extent of His grace, that we, though we were, were sinners, now we're saved by grace. Though we were once orphans, now we're sons and daughters of the living God. Though we, though we once rebelled against Him, though we once rejected Him, now we are loved and received by God. And hopefully as a community that, that we're, we're living into that. You know, Jesus um, was the most self-aware person on earth, really. I mean, he, he knew who he was. He knew what he was about. He knew what his purpose was. He knew when to uh, hide his identity. He knew when to come forth and say who he is. He knew what his purpose was. And in the same way, as followers of Jesus Christ, to grow in self-awareness is to really grow in, into a greater awareness of who we now are in Jesus Christ. That as a community of faith that we're constantly affirming this time and time again. Yes, we're sinners. Yes, we've messed up. Yes, we've fallen. Yes, we still make a mess of our lives. But at the same time, simultaneously, we are loved and accepted and received through His grace, through His love as his people, as sons and daughters. And so that is the greatest awareness that we can have, is to be present to the reality that, yes, we're sinners, but we're fully loved. Yes, God knows everything, but he doesn't reject it, but he fully loves us. So, brothers and sisters, as you think about your own life, as you think about just your own degree of self-awareness, Maybe you're lacking in it. Maybe there's all these things swirling on and within us and we just don't really know why. And I know a part of it is just the times that we live in. These are really difficult times. And as we're getting squeezed because of just all the pressures that there are, whether it be in our workplace, whether it be not being able to find work, whether it be just parenting because schools, we don't know what to expect next week, next month, what have you, because of just illness or sickness, we're getting pressed on all sides. And oftentimes, again, a mess kind of spills out. And as the mess spills out, what is your tendency? Is your tendency to try to clean it up and to try to like contain it and make sure that nothing spills out anymore. We're trying to protect that image. We're trying to find ways to just kind of make sure that we appear to everybody that we're okay. Or is it perhaps in light of this message, perhaps more appropriate to recognize, yeah, that's, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm a mess. I, I'm emotionally a mess. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm just, just disillusioned. I'm all these things. And the, 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 and the, the, 
faster we're able to be honest with ourselves and with God and with other people with that, the more we can also be honest with, with the fact that we, through all of that, yet we're still fully loved. And isn't that what we are all actually needing at this point in life? That <laughs> out of anything, uh, what we need to know in a more deeper and, and more satisfying way is just that, that we're loved, that we're still His beloved, that, that nothing that, that we could ever do, no matter what happens in this world, that truth and that reality stands for all eternity if you're in Christ. And if you don't know that reality, either you just are exploring Christianity today, or maybe you've followed Jesus, but you've just kind of lost sight of that, I would just encourage you right now that you would just bear your soul before God. God knows everything about you anyway, rather than trying to hide things, rather than trying to just continue to protect yourself, to be able to just be and let God love you, to let God just be the one who cleans up the tears and cleans up the mess, to let God bring the healing to the wounds that have been festering, to let God be the one who informs the way that you should see yourself. That is the opportunity before you. That's the invitation that God is bringing to you into our community. And so let's offer ourselves to him. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we want to take this moment to uh, acknowledge uh, that you are God. A God who is vast, a God who is majestic and holy and above us. A God who is transcendent, a God who is holy and powerful. And yet, God, at the same time, you are a God who is personal, a God who desires closeness and intimacy with, with, with us. And Lord, sometimes that's really hard to fathom. They seem like they're two different things, but yet you're one in the same, a God who is great, a God who is majestic, but you're also a God who is near to his people. And Lord, all of us are carrying heavy burdens to all in varying degrees. And Lord, we're tired we're frustrated, we're angry, we're scared, we're fearful. And so, Lord, you know all these things. And your posture towards us is, is not folded arms and disapproval, but, Lord, you, your, your posture is open arms. And your posture is compassion towards your people, compassion towards the brokenhearted, compassion towards the lowly. And so, Lord, if there's any part of us that is still prideful, there's any still part of us that still wants to hold on to what we insist is, 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 is good and right. Lord, help us to be able to let go of that and be able to just face the reality of not only our own brokenness, but also the reality of your love. And so, Lord Jesus, would you come and, and minister among your people right now, Lord, even though we're not able to be with each other physically to provide a certain level of comfort, Lord, I pray that through your spirit that you would touch each and every single one of us so that we may just be known, be loved, and, and, and to just look at life in a completely different way because of our standing before you now in light of what Christ has done, that we are your beloved, that we are sons and daughters, that we are yours now and forever. And for any of us who, where that's a new thing, where that's something that is, is, was foreign uh, coming in, but Lord, so, but yet something that, that draws some of us, Lord, would you meet them there, meet each person and draw them into relationship with you. So Lord, we, Give this time into your hands. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for the message. At this time, let us offer ourselves to God, including our tithes and offering, if you haven't already done so. Let us respond to God with our closing song.
Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. And from beginning to the end, it'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else. Yes, it's all about you, from my heart to the heavens. Jesus, be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, from my heart to the heavens. Jesus, be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about church. Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Jesus, you center of it all. Yeah. Again, thank you for joining us for worship. And so we, again, we would invite you to stick around and, and join us for uh, just a Zoom call where we could just update each other on what's going on with our lives, what's going on with church, and, and to pray for each other and pray for the church and the world. So we invite you to stick around for that. We also have a time for that on Wednesday as well. We have community groups that uh, are, are meeting, and so we just encourage you to get connected in some way. Uh, but as you uh, begin your week, we just um, just want to bless you and and send you with, with uh, God's uh, love and blessing. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. All God's people say together.
Amen. We will see you next week. Blessings. Thank you.